Well, we're going to uh, wrap up this evening on the God Touch, and we are in the 16th step toward the God Touch, and that is do everything you do by faith. We've given you 15 so far. Number one, tithing. Number two, offerings. Number three, diligence and work. Number four, faithfulness in marriage. Number five, faithfulness for the sake of your children. You might be here tonight, and you're not married, or maybe you don't have children. The point is the character trait of faithfulness. Step number six, get the toxic people out of your life, and that's the one people have trouble with. Number seven, find a pattern worth emulating and then be true to it. People have trouble with that also. Number eight, manage your debt. Number nine, control your spending. Number 10, prosperity, confession. And confession is just huge. Uh, number 11, invest in yourself. In other words, finish your education, keep reading in your area of uh, your vocation. Uh, number 12, conscientious saving. Number 13, prudent investing. Number 14, become a land owner instead of a rent payer. Number 15, guard your marriage. And of course, not everybody's married, but if you're married, guard your marriage. And we end up with 16, do everything you do by faith. Austin covered last Wednesday, number one, God will bless all the work of our hands. We're not going to review that. And let's go immediately to new ground. Number two, if you're taking notes, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you really want to prosper, if you really want to walk through life with the touch of God upon your life, then you have to discipline yourself to do everything you do in faith, believing that God is blessing all the work of your hands. And this right here is, uh, it really goes to the heart and core of how our country has been sabotaged. The very fact that uh, this crazy sexual pervert and I'm talking about the male, uh, is one of the most popular politicians among young people, is indicative of the, faith, of the fact that people want something for nothing. It's really ridiculous. There's no such thing. I wonder, I wonder who raised these people. I mean, you know, didn't your mother ever tell you there's no such thing as something for nothing? And, uh, and the same thing is true in our walk with God. I mean, people... people and this is the problem I have with social media Christianity. I like to call it fortune cookie Christianity. You know, and you see it all the time in social media. And, and I, I, I appreciate guys, and I, I don't want to be critical, and I'm not going to name names, but I, I don't send stuff out there like, you know, you are the blessed of God in Jesus' name. I don't think it's honest. Because who am I talking to? I mean, I could, I could say to somebody here tonight, you are the blessed of God in Jesus' name, because I know there's... I know who I'm talking to. But when you just blast stuff out over social media, I mean, you could be talking to Charles Manson in prison or whatever, you know, reading your blog. I mean, you don't know who you're talking to. And I just don't think it's honest. And I know this, that, that to make the Word of God work in my life, well, I have to line myself up to the Word of God. And sure, it'd be nice to skate. It'd be, it'd be great, right, if I could get something for nothing, but it doesn't work that way. And so I have to change. I've got to conform. I've got to bring myself in alignment with the Word of God. And so over and over and over, the Bible promises to bless all the work of our hands, and yet people don't want to work. And uh, in fact, Bernie Sanders, that's the guy who I was talking to, if you're trying to figure out, now which pervert is he talking about? Uh, but, because uh, you know, there's like a plethora. And... Uh, but he, he, he gave a speech just in the last seven days that, that he, he has a vision for America we, where we are not burdened with uh, working for a living. And so really, really the vision is almost like Star Trek Next Generation, as some of you are not old enough to remember Star Trek Next Generation. But, you know, in Star Trek Next Generation, basically the theory was nobody had to work for a living and everybody had sex with everybody. And that was the whole thesis of the culture. So they were able to explore the galaxies and do research and stuff because nobody had to work for a living. And so it's like, you know, people think we're going to get to this place, this utopia place where nobody has to work for a living and everybody has sex with everybody. Well, anybody that has studied history knows that family is the bedrock of any culture not government. Say it out loud. Family, family. is the bedrock of any culture. Bedrock of any not, culture. Government. not government. And the other thing is, 
you, if you don't work, you don't eat. And, uh, I mean, at some point, at some point, I mean, there are more people tonight in the United States of America on welfare than have full-time jobs. So at some point, the music's going to stop and somebody's not going to have a chair. You know who's not going to have a chair? The people who weren't doing the God touch. The people who weren't saving money. Amen. Amen. Because, let me ask you, because I see a lot of new faces. Does it or does it not stand to reason? Is this or is this not logic? You cannot have more people riding in the cart than you have people pulling the cart. And you might go a year or two on momentum but at some, and borrowing, but at some point, it's got to stop. That's right. yep. And so, I know it. He's so old-fashioned. <laughs> you know, he believes in marriage, and, and he believes in working for a living. Uh, you know, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't go with girls who do. You know what I'm saying? In other words, I mean just old-fashioned. But you know what? Old-fashioned is what made America the richest, greatest nation on the planet. And now we're all cowering in fear because some guy marries some crazy woman from the Middle East and radicalizes him and he goes to work and shoots the place up. My God, my God, my God. Tell your neighbor, if you're single, don't date crazy people. Amen. That's your word from the Lord for tonight. Amen. If you're single, don't date crazy people. Amen. If you're dating a, some gal and she thinks, you know, you need to learn how to make pipe bombs, that's somebody to uh, ditch. Amen. And go back online and try and find somebody else. <laughs> I mean, is this a stupid country or what? I mean, you know, I mean, California is full of, you know, women. And you go online and find some woman from the Middle East who wants you to learn how to make pipe bombs. I mean, my God, my God, my God. I mean, how stupid has our country become? I mean, literally, if, if 30 years ago, if somebody had stood in church and prophesied we'd be here, nobody would have believed it. Nobody would have believed it. Now there's a 60-year-old man who sits around the house pretending he's a six-year-old girl and demands that everybody address him and talk to him like he's a six-year-old girl. I mean, that's how nuts our country has become. Unbelievable. And the guy, you know, the media will never tell you. They blame Christians for the Planned Parenthood shooting. But that guy, uh, on his voter registration card, uh, said he was a woman. But the media won't tell you. So that was a Caitlin wannabe. That wasn't a Christian. And you know as well as I do, no man who identifies as a woman is a Christian. I just say that for the sake of the new folks so you can decide right here, right now. I mean, no point in wasting time coming in 2016 if this is not your church. Just clear the deck in December. Be done with it. Amen. Amen. That's not a Christian. And besides, the whole thing is ludicrous. No Christian would commit any murder. Self-defense, yes, but not a murder. So the whole concept of Christian terrorism is a media lie. It can't happen. Amen. Well, I don't know how I got off on that, but somebody needed, somebody needed to get straightened out. So number two, God is a rewarder. Say it out loud. My God is a rewarder. You know, if you could just get your mind renewed to that, it'd change your life. 
Look over here in Matthew 6, classic passage, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters either. He will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. King James is literally from the Greek mammon. So it's not really money. It's, a, it's the world's system of money. And, uh, and it's a system. For example, how, how is it that we, we vote and we think we're voting for somebody conservative, they go to Washington and they just join, uh, you know, they, we, they say we're going to go to Washington and drain the swamp. And so we <laughs> vote for them and then we find out they went to Washington and they got in the hot tub. How does that happen? It's the world system of money. Because, I mean, money's changing hands. And we don't even understand these things. You know, we're just trying to work for a living, right? We're just trying, we're right, we're just trying to buy a car. We're just trying to get our house paid, right? We, we're, not, we're not privy to all of that. How does all that work? Well, there's money changing hands. And I learned one thing about this a long time back. If you don't understand something, it's about the money. Amen. And that's why Lester Summerall, one night at my home, oh, man, I miss him. But he leaned across that coffee table and he chastised me about, uh, well, it was about our television broadcast, but he chastised me. He leaned across that coffee table and he said, son, he said, you've got to get their money. Because he said, if you don't have their money, you don't have their hearts. And he said, a man, if a man is not right with his money, that man is not right. And then he gave me scripture on it, where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. And so if a man's treasure is not in the kingdom of God, and you understand, we're not talking about all your treasure. We're talking about the tithe, offerings above and beyond, as led by the Holy Spirit, not what man tells you to do, what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. But where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. And I like what Kenneth Copeland says on this. No man can tithe and keep sinning. It can't happen. No man's going to tithe on Sunday and go commit adultery on Monday. Men are not hardwired this way. Because if that man's going to commit adultery on Monday, well, he's not going to waste his tithe on Sunday. And so sometimes women fall out with me on this stuff. But the safest place for your man to be is at Faith Christian Center doing what Dr. Gene Lingerfeld teaches. Amen. That's the safest place for your man to be. Because right. <clears throat> he, he won't get too far off the path. Amen? Amen? And even if he veers off the path a degree or two, he'll come right back. He'll get right back in line because you can't keep sinning while you're tithing. Amen. I mean, it just can't happen. It just can't happen. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so he's talking about this system. See, you're either going to serve God or you're going to serve money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you? by worrying, can add a single hour to his life. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. And he's talking about worry. He's talking about anxiety. He's talking about struggle. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run. King James says chase. See, a Christian doesn't chase money. A Christian, a, a faith Christian draws money. But we don't chase money. So I got to tell you a couple of things here because there's so many new faces. I was telling a man in the church, uh, we were talking about Investing. And I told him, I said, you know, I've left a lot of money behind. He was, he was asking me about uh, business, uh, a place to put his business, office space. And I told him I've left a lot of money behind because I just didn't want, get, want to get involved in certain things. Uh, two recessions back, I had the idea of uh, buying a building. Yeah, I'm sorry, too. 
tell them uh, you're busy. God bless you. Uh, buying a building in Aspen. It was two recessions ago. Of course, you can't do that unless it's a recession. And I had the idea, rent the downstairs for uh, a store and then do an apartment upstairs because, you, you know, you can't buy a house in Aspen. It's, it's just astronomical. So I had this idea, but it doesn't matter what I think about it. I thought I checked on a building actually also in Jackson, Wyoming. It doesn't matter. I have these ideas, but I pass on them. And the reason I pass on them is they would be a, a distraction from the ministry. I just want to do the ministry. And I, I believe God that I'll do the ministry and God will take care of me and I'm not going to have any needs. Amen. Now, I'm not bragging on me. I'm just using an illustration for new people so you kind of have an idea of where I'm coming from <clears throat> to put God first. Yeah. Now, if you're in the real estate business, well, that's different. I mean, if you're buying buildings and whatever, uh, uh, remodeling buildings or, you know, uh, doing retail space or whatever, well, that's different. But for me, that would be a distraction. You know, there's a couple of properties that I've spotted, and I would like to own the acreage, but I, I, and then I thought, well, I could buy one of those, hold the acreage, rent the house, but I don't want to do that. I don't, I, I don't even want to know about my own toilet not working. I don't want to know about somebody else's <laughs> toilet not working. Right, right. right? I mean, I don't want to do that. I don't want to get involved in that. So it's a perspective, see, that I'm going to put God first, and I'm just going to believe God that God will make it up to me. I mean, I don't see Abraham struggling. And Isaac, they came along. I mean, what kind of dirty dog people come along behind you and stop up water wells in the desert? I mean, who does that? But they did that. They came right behind him. He would dig a water well, find water, and they would stop up his water well. I mean, who does that? But he just kept digging. And God just kept blessing. See? In other words, we don't have to fall out. We don't have to get sideways. Just, just keep doing our thing, believing that God is blessing us as we do our thing. Amen. Yeah. And, and so we're talking about doing what we're doing in faith, but not chasing money. So I can believe it's coming to me. And I don't know about you, but anytime I get a I, you know, if I swing for the fences on an investment, that's the one that doesn't do well. And uh, so there's something negative about chasing. You know, I mean, I can get my faith on it. I can believe God. Uh, but, if I, but if I'm, I hate to say too aggressive, but it's almost like there's something inherently wrong when I'm trying to make something happen. Rather than trying to make something happen, use my faith and believe that it's happening. Does that make sense? And... Uh, See, faith doesn't chase, faith draws. That's the difference. Faith doesn't chase, faith draws. And so he's talking about worry, anxiety. Verse 31, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans? Chase after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first, here's the principle, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And so even now, sometimes I pull onto this property and I, I ask myself, man, who pastors here? Sometimes even now, I pull up to my own house and I, I wonder, man, who lives here? Hallelujah. I mean, because that, that's what happens when you put God first, but not, not put God first over a week. Praise put God first over time. Yes. Yes. And, and you may be new to the church, but I challenge you just to, to look around. Don't just, you know, come and go, but look around. Everything here is quality. Amen. You know, you go to some churches and they look like they're going to fall down the next windstorm. I mean, it's all quality. Amen. This uh, this floor. You know, you go to a lot of Christian churches, a lot of Christian schools, and the floor is concrete with uh, rubber paint on it. Well, that's not good for kids' knees. And, uh, or you go to Christian uh, churches or Christian schools and it's concrete with carpet. Well, have you ever fallen down on carpet? I have playing basketball. That is not any fun at all. And then still it's concrete. It's not good for your knees. And then you can put a wood floor down, but it, it doesn't have any give to it. And wood is better than concrete, but it doesn't have any give to it. It's still not really good for kids' knees. Well, what we are sitting on and what I'm standing on tonight is a springboard oak floor just like the NBA uses. 
And it's not pine. I mean, what do you think? We're word of faith people. It's not pine. It's oak. What kind of wood is that? Well, what do you think it is? It's oak. The concrete, I mean, you notice the parking lot? You can park on it and your car doesn't sink into a sinkhole. I mean, I don't even know how many acres of concrete are out there. See, God will give you whatever you're willing to believe him for. Amen. Amen. And, and I get convicted because I say to myself, we didn't believe God for enough. See, we have to stretch our faith wherever we are. So the principle is here. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And anybody that sat here five minutes knows I didn't get here through compromise. I mean, I'm preaching the Bible. How do we all do all this and preach the Bible? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, not spirituals, things. God knows you have need of things. There's a story in the Old Testament where one of the prophets was uh, dropped a hammer in, in water. Well, the, 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 the head prophet knew, you know, he needed his hammer. And so it floated to the top. God knows we have need of things. God's not against things, but he's against worshiping things. He's, he's against committing idolatry to get things or lying or cheating or stealing to get things. But he's not against things. He knows we are in the world. We, ha we have need of things. You got to have a car, right? Just to go to the grocery store. God knows that. God's not against things. Hebrews eleven six is the principle but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that's not the easy part, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now this right here goes to the heart and soul of what's wrong with our culture and what's wrong with the, the, the new cool church in America. Because it specifically says that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Say it out loud. My God, My God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him but I mean if you go to, if you talk to your average Christian and they, they, they have let's say they, they have an unmet need and you start talking to them about tithing they're going to get angry or you start talking to them about prayer how, how many minutes a day are you praying they're going to get angry or you start talking to them about Bible study how many, how many minutes a day are you reading the Bible they're going to get angry because they've been sold a bill of goods that there's something for nothing there's not something for nothing he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Say it out loud. My God, My God is, a is a rewarder of them, of them that, diligently that diligently seek him. Seek him. Okay, so let's, let's just bring it home. Let's just talk some business. I, I, I don't know the percentage. I haven't looked it up. But... Uh, I mean, we've had a great year at Faith Christian Center. On attendance, on attendance, and I'm not talking about one week versus another week. I'm talking about wherever we stand, 48 weeks versus last year, we're up to 22 point something percent. And last Sunday was up 29% over the same Sunday last year. Well, you notice I'm not preaching compromise. Right? I don't even wear uh, women's jeans. Because that's what they're, that's basically what a lot of these guys are doing. You know, the bedazzled, what do they call it? Bedazzled jeans? What do you call it? Is it bedazzled? What do you call it? I mean, that's the thing. You know, I mean, I wear guy clothes. Twenty, 22%? 22, 23%. But guess what we're doing? We're not wearing the embellished jeans and all that. What, what are we doing? What do you think Pastor Gene and Austin and Pastor Sue are doing? What do you think we're doing? Huh? Well, we're preaching the word, but what are we doing before we preach the word? Well, we're praying, living it, throw in some fasting. 
And God shows up. Well, I just don't believe. Well, there you have it. Because Jesus said, have faith in God. See? In other words, you can have faith in Bernie Sanders. And all that's going to do is make you a moocher. But I can have faith in God, then I don't have to be a moocher. I can be a producer. Amen. And you know the thing I like about being a producer? I don't have to eat the cheese somebody's handed me. I can go to the store and pick out what kind of cheese I want. You know what I like about being a producer? I don't have to live in the apartment that the government picks for me. I can decide where I want to live by God. Amen. Amen. And I don't have to drive electric cars. I don't have to plug in at Cracker Barrel. And you know, that would be a problem for me anyway because I got a 500 horsepower minimum. So, you know, I can't do that. You know, when I want it to move, man, I mean, I want it to move. So I can, I can decide what I want. But if you're dependent, then somebody else is making all the decisions for you. Amen. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, if you really want to prosper, if you really want to walk through life with a God touch on your life, then you're going to have to discipline yourself to do everything you do in faith, believing that God is blessing all the work of your hands. Let me ask you this. If you believe God is blessing all the work of your hands and you want more, what do you do? You do more. See, if I believe God's blessing all the work of my hands and I want more, all I got to do is do more because he's blessing the work of my hands. And the last point, number three, God rewards us by satisfying our desires with good things. This is just monstrous. God rewards us by satisfying our desires with good things. I'll tell you what, I just, I just feel sorry for God. I do, I feel sorry for him. The way he's been misrepresented, that he's putting cancer on children, that he's putting sickness on people, that he wants his children poor. I just feel sorry for God. I will not dishonor my Lord that way. Amen. He's got to be. Can we agree on this? Logic. He's got to be at least as good a father as I am. Can we agree on that? Well, I never would want my children to be sick. I mean, I never once saw some kid somewhere sick and then ran and got one of my kids. Go play with that kid so you can get sick too. <clears throat> but that's what they accuse God of in pulpits. I mean, I never one time saw some kid sick, went and got Austin or Christina and said, uh, I have a lesson I want to teach you. So here, go play with this sick kid so you can learn a lesson. That's despicable, but that's what God gets accused of every Sunday, somewhere. Neither of my children are on welfare. Neither of my children are dependent. I mean, what, what, kind, of, what kind of father would want his children to be dependent? That's not a good father. I'll tell you what, it grieves me. It grieves me. It grieves me. And this is one reason, you know, I just don't really pay. I mean, I, I pay attention to some news and social media, and I've got some friends that I pay attention to in social media. But preachers? Because I just, I just, I don't even want my eyes to, to set upon somebody disparaging my Father God. No, 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 no. Our speech ought to lift him up. The meditation of our heart ought to lift him up. Yes, amen. The words out of our mouth ought to lift him up. Hallelujah. The conversation at home around our tables ought to lift him up. Hallelujah. I mean, really, really, at the end of the day, you have the God you confessed. Right. That's right. Uh -huh. 
And I saw this way back. I saw this, man, I saw this about 25 years ago. I stood up on a Sunday morning, I mean, back up there at I-30, and I was just bold, and I just laid it down. I wish I had remembered what series it was. I'd love to hear those messages again. I just laid it down, and I said, you know, you got preachers down the road, and they're saying it's the will of God that they be poor, and they're saying it's the will of God that they not have anything, and they're saying it's the will of God that all of God's people be a bunch of losers. Well, they're living with the results of what they have taught. Amen. But I'm standing here, and I'm telling you, by God, it's the will of God that you have enough, and I'm telling you, by God, it's the will of God that you have more than enough, and I'm telling you, by God, it's the, the will of God that, that you prosper at everything you put your hand to, and I'm living with the results of what I taught. Amen. Amen. And I remember saying, it is a perfectly equitable arrangement. And that's why I don't feel sorry for ministers because you show me a minister and they're living with the result of, they're farmers. And they've been so in poverty. Hey, I don't feel bad if they are living in poverty. That's their problem. Amen. Amen. I've been so in prosperity. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, so, you know, you get what you sow. You reap what you sow. Psalm 91, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. With long life. And then Psalm 103, I gave you a few weeks ago on a Sunday morning. I love it. Psalm 103, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And there's music in here. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his blessings. You know how ridiculous Christians are? I mean, it'd be like going to apply for a job and you apply for the job and they like you and they say, okay, we're going to give you $50,000 a year and uh, then we're going to contribute to your 401k and we're going to give you health insurance. And Christians, this is the way Christians are. They'd sit there and say, look, I'll take the $50,000, but I don't want the uh, retirement contributions. I don't want the 401k and I don't want the health insurance. I don't believe in any benefits. Well, the employer wouldn't hire him. He'd think, you are so stupid. I, even, though, even though you're the best candidate, maybe you're not because you are just too stupid. <laughs> Nobody would go to a company and say, I don't want no benefits. But that's what they do to God. Well, I wonder what the benefits are. You don't have to wonder what the benefits are. He gave you a list. Amen. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. See, in other words, if you, if you renew your mind to the benefits, you'll go to praising God. Because benefits are blessings. Blessings are benefits. And you know what? Blessings belong to you. And I'll tell you something else. Wherever you work, they wouldn't dare say, uh, okay, you get the benefit, but you don't. You get the benefit, but you don't. They wouldn't dare do that. Benefits are corporate benefits. Right? And so if you're part of the tribe, Hallelujah. the benefit is yours. It belongs Amen. to you. Amen. Come on. We have been leaving our blessings on the table. We have been leaving our benefits behind. Why, why, why? Because we let the devil talk us out of them. You just came through Thanksgiving. Probably everybody here sat down with some negative person. You know, ought not have that, ought not be that, ought not achieve that. Ought not want that. Oh, no. I'm going to run with my people. Faith people. I'm not talking about family. Lord. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the people of God. I'm talking about brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. I'm talking about people. When you, get a, when you, when you fellowship, you ought not need therapy when you're done. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if I should get rid of that friend or not. Well, if you need therapy after you fellowship with him, then you have your answer. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins. How many of your sins does he forgive? Now, are you counting on that? Are you sure? How do you know he didn't lie? How do you know he's not just going to forgive 90% of them? 
And where are you going to spend eternity if he only forgives 90% of them? Talk to me. Are you or are you not counting on God with absolute certainty to forgive all of your sins? Well, why can't you do that with the next phrase? Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. He was either lying or he wasn't. See, and this is our problem. We do not go to God. When we go to God on that forgiveness of sins, we go to God with 100% throw down faith and we take him at his word and we believe that we are forgiven. Why can't we do that with healing? And I'll tell you, part of it is because Satan, you know, he's a deceiver. And we just, man, I'll tell you what, today's uh, Wednesday, Monday, I mean, I, I'm renewing my mind. And, and by and by, you know, in that prayer time, man, I just found myself angry. Because, see, these preachers would have you think it's God denying you. It's not God denying you. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Acts 10, 29, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went about doing good and healing all. And from the Greek, it literally reads, for healing all who were being oppressed by the devil. So it's not God if there's any sickness among us, it's not God. If there's any virus among us, it's not God. If there's any symptom among us, it's not God. And it's not God holding back healing. Well, I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast until I get God to do this or God to do that. God's not the problem. The thief cometh but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I was meditating on these things and I just told the devil, you, you, you're dismissed. Say it out loud. Mr. Devil, you have no right, no place, no authority in my life, in my home, in my money, or in my body because Jesus made an open show and spectacle of you on Calvary's cross. You are a defeated foe. I remember once at I-30 in the middle of a sermon, I had somebody go to the office, give me a magic marker. I took my shoes off and wrote on the bottom of one, the, and on the bottom of the other, devil. That's where he belongs. Amen. 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 Under our feet. Amen. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. There are people here tonight, and when I met you, <laughs> you were in the pit. But he redeems our lives from the pit and crowns us with glory, hallelujah, and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Say it out loud. My great God, my loving Father. I mean, you know, it's just amazing. I meet people all the time, and they look so old. And then I find out they're younger than me. I mean, I, I shouldn't have seen it, but I saw it. We got a birthday greeting from Kenneth Copeland. I mean, man, the man looks good. But you know, if you don't spend your life whoring and drinking and shacking and... And then you spend your life praying and fasting. Your youth gets renewed like the eagles. Amen. 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 I mean, I meet people all the time, and they're five, ten years younger than me, and I think, oh, my God. Because <laughs> living for the devil's hard. Yeah. Right. Amen. Say it out loud. He forgives all of my sins. He, all my he sins. heals all of my diseases. He, all my he redeems my life from the pit. He crowns me with love and compassion and he satisfies my desires with good things. Hallelujah. And you got people out here teaching God will meet your needs but not your desires. Nonsense. He says, say it again. He satisfies my desires with good things. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart.